It's time for another episode of Corner of the Galaxy from the Box. The show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy's Josh Gessman and LA Times soccer reporter Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Gessman, coming to you on a Monday, December 28th, just a couple days left in 2021, and the LA Galaxy definitely in full off-season mode here as we string through the uh, the Christmas holiday and into New Year's. Uh, a little bit quiet on all the fronts, as you'd expect during this uh, little in-between, this this moat between the two holidays, um, but we do have some, some news and some stuff to sort of talk about, so we're going to do that, uh, talking a little bit about uh, Lee Lionel Messi. Uh, there's going to be some Christian Pavone talk and, of course, announcements. One of those announcements happening, whether the LA Galaxy have a coach, uh, players, all that stuff. We're going to have some information for you as well to help me do all that. Uh, a man who I'm sure had a wonderful holiday. Uh, I know his internet is better. So to me, that's all that really matters. Uh, it's Kevin the Pan Baxter. Kevin, how's it going, buddy? The moat between the holidays. I've never heard it described as a moat before. I thought that was quite poetic in 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 a stream of consciousness sort of. I didn't write that down. That came from the top of my head. It is a moat, though. It, you're a poet, and you didn't know it. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> that's a grade school rhyme. You get no credit for that whatsoever. Somebody's gonna <laughs> so, laugh. Somebody yeah, laughed. Exactly. I just laughed. <laughs> so speaking of the moat, the moat when the moat ends, it'll be New Year's Eve. Um, so, what's your resolution? Uh, my new year's resolution probably to, you know what? It's actually, it's, it's a really boring one. Um, but it's, it's to work out more because when the baby came, I don't get to row, um, because I can't spend that time away from, uh, here. Cause I, I leave my wife basically watching Jake all the time. Uh, so it's to work out more. And we did get, you know, one, I'm one of those annoying Peloton people. I got a Peloton thing, so I need to like ride on it more. Um, I think, some people have suggested I just ride on it while I'm doing the podcast. Um, so, you know, if that were to happen, I think at the beginning, uh, it would be a little bit uh, unlistenable to. I, I don't think you'd be able to make it through that. But if, you know, after a couple months of that, I'd probably be okay. You know what I've been doing? I started this during the MLS's back because I would get done working, you know, like 1030 at night. And I was kind of like too pumped to go to bed and it was late. And I would just, go, I would go out for a, a walk, you know, several miles. I was in a like a vacation resort kind of thing. And I could walk with inside the, the grounds without having to go out in the street or anything. So I'd walk every night. I just, I kept doing that since I got back and I'm, I'm doing about five miles a day at the end. Of, usually at the end of the day, it's a good way to clear my mind and stuff and just get out of the house. Cause with this, you know, with COVID you're stuck in the house. So yeah, it, it's been, it's, it's been really good. At, you know, you probably can't get away. It takes me about an hour. I'll go, f- you know, walk f- five miles. And, um, you know, I'm feeling like if, anything happen if I got COVID, uh, I would go into it a little bit stronger, maybe a little bit fitter than I would have been otherwise. And if I don't get it, then I've just got the body of a Greek God when I'm done. So <laughs> either way, it works either way. This, right? is, this is a podcast non-visual. You can say anything you want and people might actually believe you. Um, so no, no, that's good. What's your, uh, what's your new year's resolution then if you, if you have one? Wow. I don't know. I have, you know, I thought about asking you and I didn't, I didn't think about the obvious question, which would be what's mine. Yeah. I, I mean, one, one of the best stall tactics in the world is for like, whenever somebody asks you a question, just ask them the same question back. So that way you can you yeah. know, get a little bit of time. But you know, I came up with an answer. I give you time to think you had to yeah. have known it was coming back at you. Well, it's so hard though. I mean, when you're so close to perfect, what can I do? You know, what, what can I resolve to do to make it better? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, the humility. I can feel it coursing through you all the time, Kevin. That's good. All right. Let's just, well, we're going to move on then. Um, I, I don't know where else to go. Uh, I, well, I did, 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 you know, here's, here's some trivia for you. Did you know that, that Pele, you know, his real name is Edson. Yes. He was named after Thomas Edison. I did not know that. Somehow a vowel got dropped out in the translation from English to Brazilian. But yeah, the story was, um, electricity came to his village. He, he grew up very poor, came to his village in Brazil right about the time Pele was born. And so his father named him Edson after Thomas Edison. That's uh, that's kind of cool. I mean, I don't so, know why. Why were you thinking about Pele today? Was it just I, it, top it, of your on mind? My fi- on my five mile walk, I just started thinking about. It. But then, of course, the galaxy angle is that means Edson Buttle is second generation named to- for Thomas Edison. 
Ah, but I don't think that they made sure, that. the galaxy they, angle there. They probably didn't make that connection, though, right? I mean... No, I doubt it. Yeah, okay, good. Just checking. Uh, speaking about greats, let's start with one. I, I joked around a little bit on oh, tw- Twitter good segue, today. Good segue. Good segue. I'm a professional. Um, I, I joked around a little bit on Twitter today. I said we'd talk about Messi for five minutes, and I'd spend the rest of the time, the balance of our, our 60 minutes, so 55 minutes, laughing about all the people who are suddenly excited about Messi coming to Ma- Major League Soccer. There was an interview... Uh, that Messi gave. And and by the way, if you're into like world football, really paying attention to what's going on around there, the least important thing Messi said was that he wanted to come play in the United States. Uh, There were tons of things that were talked about in this interview. And I think realistically, he put a pretty good smackdown on Barcelona. Um, Pretty pointed for a guy who was pretty quiet as well and doesn't normally you know just sort of lay it all out there it feels like he laid it all out there but of course uh mls being mls uh we we focus on you know the the one sentence that said maybe sometime in the future possibly maybe not but maybe uh that messi might consider playing in the united states and coming to major league soccer so um I don't know. Is is the center of the country also having like is Sporting Kansas City having this discussion about how they're going to bring Messi in? Is that is that something? I'm I'm locked in Galaxy Land, Kevin. It's hard for every time there's a big name, we know the Galaxy are going to talk about it. So if Cristiano Ronaldo is suddenly out of contract, I know that LA Galaxy fans are going to want us to talk about Ronaldo. Um, you know, if Diego Acosta, because it was on our Discord today, if Diego Acosta suddenly uh, is out of contract, then all of a sudden could the LA Galaxy be going after Diego Acosta? Um, so I, I mean that that's not happening in, in Kansas City. No, you know, I, you're 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 forcing me to kind of think. I can't think of a now some Mexican players come and go to Sporting Kansas City or or Real Salt Lake or um, you know there are some foreign players, uh, you know, South Americans. But try to think of a big name player that came from Europe, whether it was American like Clint Dempsey or or you know. Bastian Feinstag or, or whoever else who didn't go to one, uh, you know, one of the, uh, you know, New York, uh, one of the two New York teams, one of the two LA teams, Seattle in the case, case of Dempsey. And now we see Miami being attractive, but um, with the exception of Schweinsteiger and then, uh, you know, who went to Chicago, it's been those big teams. And and we've talked about this a lot where every time there is a rumor of about a, a about a big name player, it always is the galaxy that's involved. And there's a number of reasons for that. One, the galaxy is a big club. It's the, tra- the traditionally most successful club. It's a club with deep pockets, uh, deep pocketed ownership. They can afford these guys. Um, when Robbie Keane goes back to Europe or David Beckham uh, or any of those guys, they don't talk about, hey, you should really go play for the Houston Dynamo. They talk about their experience with the galaxy. Um, and the other thing is, is a lot of these rumors start with the media in these countries. And if you're, covering uh you know soccer in the netherlands and you're saying someone's going to mls there's probably only one or two clubs you know and the galaxy are one of those clubs so all of a sudden you know messi's going to mls the one club they think about is the galaxy and all of a sudden messi's going to the galaxy there is a pavone angle to this though maybe that's why they haven't re-signed him because they're holding that number 10 shirt open (laughs) what do you think yeah well i mean i think we should point out that there is nothing at all zero to link messi with the la galaxy at this particular moment um, so I, I just, I don't know that I had to say that, but I felt necessary saying that just because I've seen Twitter and the discord and everything, Facebook and Reddit and sort of fill up and talk about, you know, oh, if Messi came to, to the galaxy, hey, let me, let me, can I, can I also be clear? And, and Kevin, I think this sort of falls in line with sort of Zlatan Ibrahimovic and everything else. Um, there was a point where I didn't imagine we'd ever see Zlatan Ibrahimovic playing for the LA galaxy. Um, and so I don't want to say it's impossible because it's not. Um, but to think that Messi, who is very much looking to leave, you know, in the next six months, um, on a free transfer, by the way, uh, if Messi is looking to leave in the next six months, it just, it it seems unlikely, um, at his current age that he would be looking at the LA galaxy. And if you want to have this discussion, Kevin, maybe in three years, I can be persuaded to think that that might be a, a much higher chance of, of that happening. But for the you know foreseeable future, the next one to two years, I, I just I think that this is, might be a bridge too far. Well, here's there's a ton of reasons why. You're right. There's a ton of reasons why. His age, he's still playing really well. You know, he led the league in scoring last year. He, he's looking to, forward to at least one more World Cup. And you can talk about all the advances that MLS has made. But look at the U.S. national team there's a good chance we could have 23 players on the U.S. national team, none of them playing in MLS. They've all gone to Europe to prepare for the next World Cup. 
Messi is not going to leave Europe to prepare for the World Cup here. So let's put all that aside. No, no one, no big major player like a, a Messi or Ronaldo, I don't believe, is coming to MLS until after the next World Cup. So, you know, you've got a couple of years to think about that. Um, uh, will he come? You know, I, th- I think he probably will. I think he'll probably going to d- dip his toe in the water. And I definitely think Ronaldo is going to come. But the thing with Ronaldo and some of the other players that, that uh, have come and will come, there is a marketing component to that. I don't think Messi cares about that nearly as much. I, you, would it be good for for him post, you know, when he's done playing to have, um, you know, some? He already has recognition in the United States. He doesn't really really need to build a brand, but it might help. And that's another reason why he would go to New York or L.A. or maybe Miami. Um, I do think L.A. fits of those three cities fits his personality. He's kind of a quiet guy. He's a family man. He had a house in the hills above. Barcelona. He was a neighbor of Luis Suarez, who's also, by the way, a very devoted kind of quiet family guy. He has that reputation of being kind of wild, but he really is not. His personality is not. Those two were neighbors. They used to carpool to training together. Um, Messi is not Ronaldo. He's not going to be hitting nightclubs and doing that kind of stuff. So LA is a much better fit for him. I, you're right, though. I don't think he comes now. There's a million reasons why. And if he's leaving Barcelona, which you know, again, we don't know the impetus for this. Is he trying to get a better contract? Is he trying to have a an impact on voting for the new board at Barcelona? That's open, and and the the vote will be coming up shortly. But he has a very good relationship with Pep Guardiola at Man City. Man City's got a ton of money. Whatever attraction the U.S. has for him, there are going to be major clubs in Europe like Man City, like Juventus, whoever, going to be throwing a ton of money at him. Um, and you know, one more big payday on his way out of the uh, out of Europe. It's got to be something that's really enticing to him. And there are other players, too, that are talking. I don't think will come until after 2022. But I talked earlier this this year, and we, we talked about it in the pod. I had a chance to talk to Anton Griezmann. He's definitely coming to MLS. Um, he's coming for a whole bunch of different other reasons. Um, one is he loves the NBA. He wants to come here because he wants to go to NBA games. Right. He's also talked about he's coming to MLS, and he's he's sort of hinted at coming to L.A. Well, there's two teams in L.A. I think he would lean more toward LAFC. He apparently has a pretty good relationship with Carlos Vela from the time they played together in Spain. But, um, yeah, these guys are coming. I just don't see uh, – and Messi may come here and play a year. It, it, I think it would be a very short thing. It's not going to be a Beckham kind of deal. But I don't see any of those guys coming until after the World Cup. Why would they want to do that? Yeah, it's uh, – it, it's – it's a messy proposition. Ha ha. I wanted to use the messy thing. Um, no, it's just, it's, you know, Beckham came. And you and you get on me for my puns. My, my wife today was, uh, I, I made a dad joke. I don't remember what I said. I made a dad joke. And she goes, uh, Jake is asleep, my son. He, she's like, Jake is asleep. Uh, nobody's here to hear your dad jokes. I go, the joke's on you. Dads tell jokes for themselves, not for other people. I enjoy it. Not it, it has nothing to do with you or Jake. It's a, that's I, true, I, right? I, I, exactly. I totally you, crack myself up all the time. All the time. Me too. Um, but but no, I mean, um, you know, when you look, Beckham came probably a couple years earlier than anybody thought he would ever come, and I think he took a knock for that. And certainly, you could see his regret whenever he came to the LA Galaxy. And I know people like to storybook his his MLS career, but uh, he was you know, uh, a, a hated figure, or at least a very disliked figure for a while in Los Angeles because he really didn't want to play there. He went on loan um, to AC Milan. Then he had the injury. Um, you know, he came back and really you have to go back to, you know, 2010, um, uh, 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012 um, to really get sort of the good years from Beckham that you were expecting. And so uh, I think the last thing you want from any of these guys is to come and then regret it or come and then, you know, um, get homesick. Uh, Wayne Rooney sort of, you know, points to that. Steven Gerrard, quite honestly, points to that as well, though. Um, I don't think he came too soon. Uh, I think he came too late. Um, but that was, that was uh, unfortunately, something that I think everybody learned after he had uh, he had showed up already. So, I mean, there's there's ways to sort of look at this and say, um, I, I think I want to be clear with Ga- to Galaxy fans, is there is absolutely a chance that, you know, Leo Messi could end up wearing an LA Galaxy shirt. Um, the coup, if you were going to have it, Kevin, uh, would be to get them, you know, in the summertime. Um, and that's a, certainly an interesting proposition for everybody. Uh, let's pretend, let's pretend for just a second, Kevin, like the LA Galaxy think they have a reasonable chance of getting Leo Messi this summer. Okay, so his six months are coming. They've already talked to him. He's expressed interest. What do you do now with three designated players? Well, technically, you have two designated players who are, are currently listed on there, and you're negotiating, and we're going to talk about Pavone here in a little bit, but you're negotiating for that third person. Um, so 
if Messi shows any type of interest, do you perhaps back away? But again, this is all hypothetical, but would you back away from Christian Pavone at this point? Or is it enough of an unknown that you have to sign Pavone and you deal with the repercussions of whatever you have to do to get Leo Messi? Because I'd imagine that if you are going to get Leo Messi, that you do whatever you sell your grandmother if you needed to. Does, does yeah, that- well, I, I, I think that's what would, would it be. Well, first of all, again, I'm going to go back to I, I just don't see any way he comes before the World Cup. And you're right about that other stuff. I mean, I can remember when people were saying, Gio, uh, you know, Giovanni Dos Santos was coming. And it's like, no, he's not. He, first of all, they don't even have a DP spot. And what do we know? Giovanni Dos Santos shows up. And then the next thing was Steven Gerrard's coming. <laughs> the Liverpool captain, he's not coming. And then he shows up. And then Zlatan. I mean, that was by that time, it was like, okay, yeah, Zlatan's coming. He's going to bring Ronaldo and Messi with him. And, and you just kind of like, yeah, all these guys are coming. It doesn't make any sense, but they're all coming. First of all, again, I would just want to go back. He's not coming this summer if he comes. But to your point, and and maybe this even makes your point better, if they go and try to sign Pavone, he's got to, if you're going to sign a DP, a guy like that coming for that much money, it's like Chicharito. You sign him for at least two years and an option, uh, or Carlos Vela, three years and an option. You you sign those guys long term. So you lock them up. And and that makes it tough because you, t- you go to Pavone and say, we're going to give you X million of dollars. We're not going to take a chance of you having a great season, and then all of a sudden it, it doubles what you want for your your second season. So um, we do have Jonathan Dos Santos coming out of contract um, shortly. That might open things up. But to your point, the point is, if there are three DPs locked up, what do you do? And do you hold one of those slots open on the off chance that you sign Leo Me- that Leo Messi shows an interest in coming to the Galaxy? You know what? I don't. I don't think I do because. If you are, if there is some sort of back channel to Leo Messi, or you can really find out what he's thinking, guess what? If Leo Messi wants to come to MLS and play for the Galaxy, and the Galaxy are loaded up with three DPs, guess what? The MLS Board of Governors passes a new TAM, <laughs> JAM, whatever rule. There is right. a new rule. You don't say no, Leo, gee, Leo Messi, we'd love to have you, but gee, the team you want to go to, they're kind of full right now. No, you create a new rule. There was the Beckham rule created for Beckham. There was essentially the target allocation money rule invented for Giovanni Dos Santos, and there will be a messy rule. They'll, they'll create a rule. The, he will come. Um, I don't think the Galaxy should be cocky and, 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 and throw that idea around, but I don't think they should mortgage their future holding a spot open on the off chance Messi might come. If he wants to come and he wants to come play for the Galaxy – They'll 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 create a mechanism to make that happen. Oh, but people will say it's cheating, but it won't matter because Leo Messi will be in Major League Soccer, and that'll be the ultimate goal. Uh, uh, well, a- and the other thing is, is maybe they work out a trade. Maybe yeah, your third DP is 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 Chicharito, and all of a sudden someone buy they buy out his contract, or he gets traded, or mysteriously he gets an injury. You know, it, it'll happen. I don't know. I'm not saying it'll be all above board, and, and everything will be honest, but. If Messi wants to come play for the Galaxy, he will come play for the Galaxy no matter how many DPs they have. Yeah, it's uh, again you, that you will move. And if and by the way, if MLS suddenly decided to grow a backbone on that and say nope, it's not going to happen, you will figure out a way to move somebody because the number that I would have to imagine in my head is going to be larger than any number Major League Soccer has ever seen for a player. If Leo Messi was going to come this summer, again, total hypothetical. Don't think it's happening, um, but it would be a, a, a super large number and. We're we're gonna transition and and I think we should away from Messi and and sort of this you know the little ridiculous and again it's not even a rumor he's not been linked to the LA Galaxy he just said that maybe he wants to come to MLS you know whenever before his career is over and that's fine lots of people say that and sometimes it happens sometimes it doesn't but as we transition away from from Messi and talking about the astronomical number that it would probably take to get somebody like Messi now. If you were going to get him now, the the number would be the largest in Major League Soccer history probably by two, three, four, or five times. I mean, I can't imagine it would be anything um, less than that. And if you're going to get him now, Kevin, it might also not just be a three-year deal. It might be like a five-year deal. It's not going to be short-term. It's going to be a lot, and there's going to be a ton of things wrapped into it, and MLS is going to be involved, and there's going to be all sorts of, uh, if you sell this many shirts, you get X number of dollars, and if you do this, then you get this. I mean, there's going to be bonuses um, up, up the wazoo. That would be how you'd have to make it work in in sort of the Major League Soccer structure, right, the MLS structure. But having said that, AEG is, I think, always in a position to be able to pull the trigger on that, even during this horrible 
financial crisis that I think that they're in. I, I think they're hurting. Um, and so as we transition to Pavone, I think it's important to remember that um, for Pavone, there's certainly a set amount of money that the LA Galaxy, I think, have, have sort of allocated for his outright purchase. And they're probably not going to sway or, or waver from that um, because it's going to be a lot of money in a very sort of taxing financial time. Uh, that's how it seems to me. But, you know, again, having and I've seen lots of people, I think there's this 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 undercurrent that's happening right now, Kevin, which is that there are some people who are fed up with AEG and, and, and Phil Anschutz being in charge of the L.A. Galaxy. And whenever I see that, I, I feel like people aren't seeing the big picture of Anschutz and AEG understanding that the L.A. Galaxy have one of the richest owners in world football, not Major League Soccer, but world football. And that affords them the chance to even discuss or have a have a have a, a fleeting, you know, uh, sort of flirtatious passage with a Leo Messi sort of signing thing. Well, first of all, I'm going to push back on you a little bit. I don't think Messi comes for a five year deal. I think if he comes as one or two seasons of playing. Now, the contract may say five year deal. Um, remember, one of Magic Johnson's contracts with the Lakers was a $25 million contract that paid him a million dollars for 25 years. I think he's still getting paid for that. Bobby Bonilla had the same kind of a deal with, with I think, the New York Mets. I could see them telling Messi, look, we're going we're gonna to pay you $20 million. It's going to be spread over five years. You get film four million four million a year, but you only got to play one year. I, I I could definitely see the the length of the contract, but I don't think he plays that long. But back to your point, um, you know Dan Beckerman, who's the CEO of AEG, once told me talking about yes, we do have money, but we don't always spend it. And his thing was, imagine I want a cup of coffee, and um, they're selling cups of coffee, but the cups of coffee they're selling at my Starbucks are twenty dollars a cup. I'm not going to buy that. I want a cup of coffee. I have $20. I can spend $20. I won't, I won't miss it at all. But a cup of coffee is not worth $20. That's kind of his ham-handed way of saying, we can spend on what we think something is worth, but we're not going to throw a ton of money at uh, Julian Araujo just because we can. If he, you know, can we can sign him because he's uh, his contract is such in such a situation that we can get him for less, we're going to do that. And so, yeah, they can go out and get guys, but only the guys, you know, if it's worth it, they are in a financial stress. You know, they didn't have um, at Coachella this year. They didn't have a lot of their concerts there. The, their buildings in Europe have all been vacant. You know, they are, they are hurting just like everybody else. Can they come up with money if they need it? Yeah. But when you're talking about Pavone and we've known all along, Boca Jr. says we want $20 million. That's that $20 cup of coffee. He's not worth 20 million. By the way, there's a messy angle there too. Remember, Mess, uh, Messi and Pavone are teammates on the Argentine national team, played right. together in the World Cup. So maybe, maybe he sells them on LA <laughs> at some point. But yeah. uh, you know, come play with me. But y y the point being, he's not worth twenty million dollars in the galaxy's mind. Um, I think that if a deal gets done, I still think it gets done around ten or eleven million. The galaxy countered, and they've been firm on this price. They're countering with about nine million for Pavone. I think that's a good strategy because if they are clearly lowballing him, he's worth more than eight million, and I think Dennis Teclosa would tell you that if you gave him truth serum. But by going starting at eight million, he can come up and arrive at a price that the Galaxy are comfortable with. If he started at ten million, he'd have to come up, and then all of a sudden you're getting into area into uh, you know money that he's not comfortable paying. So, I think the Galaxy are handling this wisely. I I know there's a deadline coming up, which you're going to explain in a minute is not a deadline, but I also feel like the Galaxy are prepared to walk away from this, that if the cup of coffee is still priced at $20 or $15, that cup of coffee is not worth it, and they'll go somewhere else. Uh, it, you know, He's the leading scorer, the leading assist guy. He's the only one on the team that even could sniff an MVP vote last year. He's very important, but I think the Galaxy are just saying, look, just because we're desperate, we don't have to act that way. Yeah, and I think it's important. I, I want to say, you know, you and I had a little discussion about Pavone earlier today, and it was something that, that you said because I said, you know, I think that there's, there's um, there feels like there's more pressure on Boca right now to sort of get a deal done than perhaps there is with the LA Galaxy. I think you're right. I think the LA Galaxy can and are in a position to be ready to walk away, and they have that sort of in their 
in their quiver, right? We saw a report, um, I think last week, maybe before the holiday, um, that said, you know, the LA Galaxy had walked away from discussions with with Boca Juniors. And I had theorized that if that, that it very well could be true, but that if they were, it might be a, you know, a, a posturing. A, there might be some posturing involved there. There might be some one of the things that is happening, you know, sort of as the LA Galaxy say, fine, you know what, we're, we're done here. We don't have anything more to discuss. We gave you our best offer, which I think reportedly is around $8 million, but, you know, I, I think anywhere between 8 and 10 is probably there and uh, it was 8 million for a hundred percent of uh, of Pavone and then it was uh, countered by 10 million with the 20 percent uh, 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 sell-on clause from Boca which values Pavone by the way at about 12 and a half or 13 million dollars we talked about this before and sort of his valuation but the whole thing that sort of sits in this is that there's pressure on the LA Galaxy, and you were right about this, there was pressure on the LA Galaxy because one of the few things that didn't suck in 2020 was Christian Pavone, right? Uh, and Kevin, you rightfully pointed out that if you let go of the one sort of shining thing, uh, maybe one of, of two and the other one being maybe Julian Araujo, uh, if you let go of the one shiny thing that you had in 2020 that clearly showed that Christian Pavone was among the league's best um, you know, in, in on a team that was clearly among the league's worst, uh, that it, it's sort of a slap in the face to, to the to the fans. And I'll add that. Yeah, I don't think you said that, but I think it's a slap in the face of the fans. It's sort of like, yeah, we had something good, um, but, you know, we can't hold on to it and we're going to let it slip away. So I think that's the pressure that comes from the LA Galaxy. What, what do you did? I did it characterize that correctly? Yeah. And, and I think one of the things is I think both both teams are playing chicken with each other. I think Boca Juniors knows that, and they're saying, look, you're going to let the one thing that was good, you're going to let that get away? How are your fans going to handle that? Well, believe it or not, I think the Galaxy, I, I know they care about their fans, but if there was one time to maybe m- maybe do something that would be a little unpopular, this might be the offseason to do it because they're going to open the season without fans regardless. And if Dennis DeClosa believes this is the right decision – um, this might be the year where he opens in March without the, the star player. And then by the time fans come back in the summer, the team's playing well and, and all is forgotten. But back to the original point, I think both teams are playing chicken with each other. I think Boca Juniors is saying, really, you're going to start the season without without your big guy? How are your fans going to handle that? And I think the Galaxy are saying to Boca Juniors, really, you're not going to take this $10 million? You guys are broke. You have no money at all. We're handing you money. This is in your bank account tomorrow morning. And you don't want it. And the other thing is, as you were talking about, Pavone's going to go back to them. He's he would automatically be the highest paid player on the team because or, or uh, one of them. It's at least close. Like it's it's very close about how much money. I can't remember exactly um, what it was, but there's a rule that says that players who go on loan and get paid a certain amount, the the Argentine um, players union basically says that when you come back, you get paid the same amount because they don't want to see this decrease um, in the thing. So technically speaking, Boca is on the hook for whatever the LA Galaxy were paying him. And, you know, that was 1.2, I think, in 2019. And we didn't see a release in 2020. And there could have been a, uh, a, a, a an increase in that. In fact, we expect that there was an increase in that. Um, and so Boca, who have who apparently having money problems, not only do they lose the 10 or, or 12 million that they could get, but then they have to pay that salary unless they can flip Pavone somewhere else and if they could do that then what are they messing around with the galaxy for um so i i think the galaxy are saying to them look you don't want the 10 million you want to pay him uh, you know two million when he comes back home well good luck with that i hope you can balance your books yeah if you go on transfer market it's interesting because pavone at least in in transfer market and their valuations their market value for players show christian pavone as the highest uh, highest market value player on uh, Boca Juniors. Now, he's not training with them and he's not with them because his contract runs until December 31st. And, you know, this was sort of the point that I wanted to to reiterate. And I said it today on Twitter and the Discord and some other places. And I, I, I usually can be a little long uh, or, or a little bit more better explain. Um, I can better explain things on the podcast than I can and, and, you know, limited number of characters. But the December 31st is not a deadline to absolutely get this Pavone deal done. And, you know, I think that trying to expect that a deal will get done before that is probably not going to happen. It's certainly not going to happen this. Um, You have to understand something. And and I was talking to uh, somebody within the organization about this. um, And and the the acknowledgement is that Boko is very, very difficult to deal with. Um, and if you know Minnesota United and you watch any of the um, the Emmanuel Reynosa deal, 
uh, Reynoso deal uh, that he came from Boca in September, but the rumors and the no- negotiations for that, Kevin, started in February. So it took them eight months to get a deal done. Um, Boca is known for being difficult. Everybody knows that they're difficult. Yeah, but it, the, the Franco deal, the Franco deal should have been done before COVID blew it up. Yeah, and, and so there there are all sorts of um, difficult things uh, that that happen, you know, between Argentina and, and certainly with Boca Juniors. And Boca has a board, um, and that board has to approve things. Um, and so you're talking about a bunch of people that have to agree that this is the best course for, you know, a team. And you're looking at the highest market value player for Boca Juniors is Christian Pavone. Now, there were rumors out there, by the way, we, I, I sort of say there's there's some bad math that's been out there. And so we sort of have to point that out as well, Kevin, which is, you know, there were rumors out there that per, uh, that apparently Arsenal wanted Christian Pavone for 40 million dollars. All right. Now. That was a little while ago, and it was before he sort of uh, took a little hit on the uh, on Boca and, and didn't wasn't playing as much, and you know really sort of resurrected his career here with the LA Galaxy and with Gamma Barish Colotto, and that's why they were looking for him and wanted to bring him, you know, up to the LA Galaxy. But you know there was rumors that maybe he was worth as much as forty million dollars. Um, I'll tell you right now, if Boca got offered forty million dollars for Christian Pavone, they would have taken it. Um, and so they didn't, and he's not worth that. And then we've been told, you know, it was $20 million for the buyout. And I think Dennis DeCloso has always said they were never going to pay that. Um, and that's why I think he, he had indicated a, a couple different times that it, it was lower than that in terms of he was going to get it lower because he's not worth $20 million. And right now we see Boca valuing him around $12.5 million. And the LA Galaxy is saying he's worth about $8 million. Uh, there's, there's, you know, that's a long way from 20 and 40. So anybody throwing out these 20 and 40 numbers isn't paying attention to what's going on in world football and it could very well be that christian pavone is worth around 10 to 12 million dollars maybe even as low as 9 million dollars um but that's sort of where his valuation is and Boca's going to get nervous after december 31st because one they'll need somebody to come along and want christian pavone for more than what the la galaxy are offering and that could very well happen and that may be how the la galaxy end up losing this deal kevin um but at the same time they're going to have to start paying that that wage bill every week um, or how, how, however often they, they, they end up paying it. But they have to pay that now, and that's on them. And that starts on January 1st when he has reportedly been told to report to training uh, with Boca. So there's, a, well, there's some pressure there. That, that alleged Arsenal figure, which I don't believe either, but at the time that that number was floated, that's when he was at the top of his game. He had just come off the world cup. He had played a little bit in Russia. It wasn't obviously a starter, but he had played in Russia, um, was a young player, uh, someone that everybody thought a lot of and thought he was going places. He came back and had that attitude problem where it was like, I just played it for the Argentine world cup team. I don't need to worry about this club stuff. And he, he, he really, his career really took a dive for about an 18 month period. And you're right. He resurrected here with the galaxy. So that arsenal number that was out there, that's when he was at the top of his game. He, he, he is still trying to get back there one. So that if that figure was there, and I don't believe that it was certainly not there now, another reason arsenal doesn't have $40 million. Very few clubs do. They may pay money for uh, a Messi or a Ronaldo, but anybody else, um, you know the transfer market's been depressed by COVID, and and as this, as the the coronavirus continues to linger on, people are on clubs are unsure where that money's going to come from, and they'll they'll pay for a, a Messi or a Ronaldo a guy that's going to sell shirts and 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 bring attention, but a guy like Pavone that may indeed help you on the field, but doesn't really move the needle elsewhere might be a guy that you don't spend that money on right now because the money's not there. So, but you talk about the date the the you know, end of the year when the contracts and, and the loan is up and he goes back to to Boca. That, that's an interesting date for both teams. And here's why. Because the Galaxy, because he's on loan to them, they sort of have exclusive rights right now. If Boca thought somebody else was out there with a lot of money, they could just say, no, the loan is up, come back. But right now, I believe they can only negotiate with the Galaxy. So the Galaxy have a window to negotiate. And if the Galaxy decide to let that go past January 1st, they run into the problem of now the world can bid on this guy and do we wind up losing him? And Boca Juniors may want to test that. They may want to say to the Galaxy, look, there's a lot of people that want to pay more than you do, so I guess we're going to move on. And the, and then you're right, the Galaxy lose the player or they have to pay more. Conversely, that market could open up and 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 all of a sudden Boca may, is getting $6 million from Arsenal and $7 million from Barcelona or whomever, and all of a sudden the Galaxy says, aha, 
well, now we're not going to give you $8 million. Now we're going to pay you the $6 million, which Arsenal did. And all of a sudden, Boca loses money. So um, it's a little bit of a gamble for both sides. Right now, they're just talking to each other. Once that conversation brings in more people, you know, it could hurt one side or the other. Yeah, well, and, and the other part about that, and I, again, we usually hear about rumors involving players, right? I mean, if Arsenal was sniffing around Pavone, no team is going to wait until after the LA Galaxy have sort of had their say. They've already put Besides, feelers look, out. If, if Arsenal was doing that, Soccer Diva would have been all over it. Yeah, exactly. Sophie would have been would have been nailing that first. But I mean, that's that, but that's sort of my point is that we hear about when it comes to high profile players, it's pretty hard to keep anything secret. And you and I talk about how things get leaked all the time because we hear them get leaked to us or they get leaked to other people. It's that it, it might not be the player, but you know, the player's brother that is there and the brother has a best friend and the best friend goes to, to this person and talks. I mean, it, it happens all the time that that's how you end up hearing this stuff. It's pretty hard to keep somebody. If Christian Pavone was on anybody's list right now, we probably would have heard about it. It doesn't mean that we won't. And with the, you know, the European transfer window opening very soon, I would like to remind everybody, by the way, MLS transfer window does not open very soon. It opens in February, February 10th. Um, and it goes all the way till May something. I can't even remember what which just date it is, but it goes well into May. Oh, uh, May 4th, by the way. February 10th to May 4th is the uh, is the MLS transfer window. Nothing. That means that technically speaking, Kevin, the LA Galaxy could sign Christian Pavone on May 3rd and bring him into this team. Um, and, you know, I, I'm not saying that that's how long it'll take. I honestly think at some point there's a there's a point where the LA Galaxy walk away and they don't come back to it. Um, but at the same time, there's not this outside of any outside or, or except for any outside pressure. Right. Like you talked about teams coming in, teams making a, a, a bid, trying to, you know, sort of feel the uh, test the waters. There's no hurry for the LA Galaxy to do this, and it may even be in the LA Galaxy's benefit to at least see where it is. Dennis talked about, um, and I think it was in one of his conference calls, but talked about trying to get a a measure of what Christian Pavone was worth in a COVID uh, you know, transfer window. Um, and the bottom line is they're trying to look for similar players that have have sort of been, been moved, and we've seen this depressed transfer market not necessarily produce that type of information. And so the LA Galaxy are trailblazing, bra- and Boca are trailblazing on this. Boca's saying, oh, well, this type of player is worth $12.5 million in this COVID transfer window. And and the LA Galaxy are saying, no, 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 he's only worth eight. And there's no valuation to sort of compare him to, and because of that, it gets muddy, and it's not as easy to sort of, um, you know, figure out if there was a player that was of Pavone's age and similar position and had just moved from here to there. You all of a sudden the market gets set, and everybody sort of knows what that is. Um, but there haven't been a lot of moves, um, you know, during this this depressed transfer market, and because of that, it's hard to value these players. So these teams are trying to do that, and with more teams possibly coming in to bid on Pavone, you may get a better idea of what that value actually is. But, and if the Galaxy get that value, perhaps they're able to spend it but they're they're they have a limited purse string they're they do not have a a whole bunch of money to just sort of they can't overpay for pavone that's something that cannot happen in 2021 well no and and you talked again about how uh, phil Andrews has you know he's one of the richer owners in world football but again it it's mls you're not you're not talking about teams like man manchester city with a half a billion dollar payroll um you know we're talking about a club with you know a, a league with a salary cap uh, you know, that it basically money that Leo Messi loses in his sofa cushions every year, and that's the salary cap. So, you know, I have to kind of keep things in perspective, and, and, and a huge contract the Board of Governors might not approve anyways. But it, it, it more goes back to, yeah, I want a cup of coffee, but I don't want to pay $15 you know, dollars for the cup of coffee. What's really going to be interesting, I think, is is as we get to the end of this week, if, if, if it goes that far, if all of a sudden we go through Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not much movement, what if it gets to late on, on, on New Year's Eve when uh, the loan's about to expire? What if all of a sudden Dennis's phone lights up and it's focused saying, yeah, we're ready to make a deal. Let's do it. Let's do it for the, what'd you say, $10 million? Let's do it for $10 million. Right. Th- that might be the moment where Dennis says, you know, I'll get back to you in the morning because if if Boca panics like that and decides they want to cut a deal quickly right at the at, at the buzzer, I think that would be a message that they've found out that there's nothing better, uh, there's no better deals out there. They'll take the eight because no one else, or the ten or whatever it is because no one else is going to come close. Does Dennis then pause and say, "I'll get back to you tomorrow"? Or deal's probably going to be around seven because that's what you're getting from Europe, right. um, uh, or, or does he just say, "Look"? We offered ten. We're going to pay ten, and 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 keep good relations with the team and 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 the rest of 
the, the teams in South America knowing that the you know, the Galaxy are not going to try to squeeze every nickel out of you. That that might sort of be the classy way to go and might play pay long term benefits because the coronavirus, you know, hopefully is not going to last forever. And at some time, at some point, the, the dollars are going to go back to where they used to be. And it would be nice for the Galaxy to to have a reputation of, as being a straight shooter when it comes to that kind of stuff. I and mean, do we think and and I think the answer is yes, but I'll I'll pose it to you anyway. Do we think that now that Gabriel Barrascoloto is not the head coach, that there's less of a prerogative for sort of or less incentive for Boca Juniors to sort of you know play nice and and get a deal done? Is is without that link now? And certainly they dealt with Dennis before, um, and they got the deal done with Dennis. But Guillermo was there, and they sort of knew who it would be benefiting. Um, but do you think now that Boca Juniors is sitting there saying, you know, there's not really uh, you know all this 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 motivation for us to be. Uh, to get this done, it's just not you know not worth it to us. And if they have the money, then you know that's sort of the question. If Boca has the money, then why don't they keep them and sort of see where that goes? Um, do you think because Guillermo has been fired, do you think that there's less of a chance of this getting done? Well, I think Dennis is always going to have a real big footprint in Latin America, and we're going to see a lot of Latin American players continue to come in. But you remember there was a time with Guillermo that it seemed like everybody who had ever – kicked a soccer ball in Argentina was all of a sudden trying out or, or you know, being talked to by the Galaxy. It, it was very heavily Argentine, uh, you know, the, the player pool they were looking at. And that's understandable because that's what Guillermo was comfortable with. But to answer your question, remember Guillermo did – he was not re-signed there. I don't remember if it was if he was fired or if he walked out or if it was mutual agreement, but Boca was kind of done with him. Yes. And so it, it depends, I suppose, and I know they've had a shakeup in their board too. So I, I, I really can't say how John Rojas would be able to answer this, but how was – how is Guillermo perceived down there? It might be, ha ha, um, you know, you fired the guy we hated and therefore, yeah, you, you know, let's do some business. Or it could be, you know, you stole our guy and now you let him go. And you know, what's going on? We don't trust you guys. So I, 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 I can't answer that question. I could make argument that it could go both ways, but you know what? The dollars are what the dollars are. And, and that is probably going to, trump anything else that, that if they need the money it, you know either they swallow hard and take it or they gladly take it but they still take it yeah it, it's it's all by the way talk to to john or texted john today so john rojas so um he was he was he was uh uh he, he was asked some questions about uh boca and just sort of where uh pavone where he saw things so definitely uh, uh john who was who was again my press box buddy he was my next my my seatmate in the press box um always uh, always has his pulse on uh, on things down in argentina so very interesting sort of uh, uh look at at argentina about you know pavone um, in my mind, the LA Galaxy have a set number in their head of what they're willing to pay for Pavone, and if it's not that, I think they're walking away. And I would say this, that while that would be a disappointment, I think certainly to Galaxy fans, and a disappointment for MLS, I mean, Christian Pavone is very good, um, and I think he could be very good on a better team as well, so if the LA Galaxy can put something together under a new head coach, um, then, then maybe that makes some sense. But at the same time, if you're willing to spend eight or nine or ten million dollars on a player, that also means with a designated player spot that you're able to use that money to go out and get somebody else as well. And for I have to imagine that for eight or ten million dollars, Kevin, uh, that you would be more than likely to find you know a very good player. Here's here's the thing though, with Christian Pavone, I think you know what you're getting, right? You've you've seen him play in MLS. You know he can do what he he needs to do. You've seen him score goals. You've seen him put the assists up. He's a very balanced player. <laughs> He's a very dangerous player in Major League Soccer. He can take over games. So there's not really a question mark about uh, Pavone in terms of his playing coming to MLS. Anybody else that you're going to bring into MLS who's not played here and who's not proven themselves in this league, and we've seen it time and time again, the guys who are good in other leagues come to Major League Soccer, maybe the motivation isn't there because they're older and they just are looking to sort of retire and kick back, or they just don't pan out for whatever reasons, uh, for whatever reason. And, you know, Robbie Keane may not have panned out if, if you get Robbie Keane. You know, it did work out, and that's great, but there's always a chance the people you sign don't work out. I think the best thing that we could look at is Zlatan Ibrahimovic. There was a chance that didn't work out. You didn't know whether or not he was going to be able to recover and whether or not he was going to be able to play again, but you took a gamble, and it wasn't a very large gamble because it was a TAM gamble, but you, you took a gamble, and it worked out unbelievably well for the LA Galaxy in terms of you know the goals scored and everything else. So there's always a chance things don't work, but with Christian Pavone, He's probably worth a little bit more than maybe you would spend on somebody from outside coming in, just knowing that he can produce in Major League Soccer and that he does like living in Los Angeles and and that things would probably go pretty well for him. 
I, I'd like to see Dennis's backup list because you know he has a list of players that he's going to turn to if the Pavone thing doesn't work out. My guess would be a lot of them are Mexican. Um, you know, it would be somebody that if they could get sort of on the same schedule, they would have them for the start of the season. They wouldn't have to wait till the summer. It would be somebody that, in a sense, it's a lateral move. I think the leagues are kind of equal in in uh, um, in talent levels, competitive balance, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, you know, the, the the salaries are not wide. You know, the, the salaries are kind of equal. I, I do think you get some of those people that, that players that do come over from Europe and they look at this as a big step down if they've been a big star. Some of the South Americans, of course, see it as a big step up because they get regular paychecks and everything else. Uh, so I think that plays into it. But one other thing is, is he came here on a loan. He played very well. He was here a season, a season and a quarter or so on a loan. Um, Dennis and then Guillermo before him, uh, they both talked a lot about building a culture. What do we stand for? What, what is the culture of, of the team? There wasn't a culture when they came in. Bruce had a culture, started to get away from him a little bit at the end. There was no culture with Kurt. He was only here for 20 games. And then Ziggy completely remade the team. And then Guillermo came in and remade the team again. So there's been this churn and we don't know what the galaxy stands for. And we don't know what the players stand for. We don't know how they mesh, what the culture is. And I bring that up only because look at the players that Dennis had brought in. He brought in Fabio Alvarez on a transfer. He's gone. He didn't, he are on a loan rather. He didn't stay. He brought in Uriel Antuna on a loan. He didn't stay. Um, now Pavone, if Pavone goes, that's the third guy. Um, and, and you can argue about how valuable those other guys were. I think they were useful. I think they could have developed into something. Um, but they're they're gone. And now if Pavone gone, it goes, that's three big guys in, in, in less than three seasons that have come here, played reasonably well, in the case of Pavone, very well, and have all left you know, because the loan expired, played, played less than two seasons. It makes it really difficult to build a culture that way when your your top line guys, the guys that you're counting on, who dis, who define what you are, those guys don't stay. And uh, you know, I I understand why Dennis did the loan. It was a good idea at the time. He couldn't keep the guys, but you're not going to build any long term cohesion and chemistry and a culture if all the guys you bring in on loan and then you don't keep them. Well, I mean, I am I am less on. I, I know you harp on that a lot, and it's not a criticism, but it's, I'm less of a, um, of a of someone who will criticize you know coaches or, or GMs for bringing guys in on loan. I think the object here is to understand the loan and to understand whether or not you'd be able to keep a person, um, you know, past that loan. And so with Pavone, you know, maybe that was a bit of a stretch, but you know, I, I think that despite the fact that. COVID has certainly uh, ravaged uh, uh, whole populations, and certainly here in the United States, we, we've done a horrible job. Um, it has brought Christian Pavone into a realm of affordability that perhaps would not have been there had it not been for this pandemic. And, you know, you can look at that however you want. But m my argument here is that loans can work as long as you understand the limitations of those. I mean, you know, Fabio Alvarez was was a great um what was a, was a good player for the la galaxy he wasn't great uh, i think he's playing for pumas down in liga mx and he's playing very well there so he had it within him and maybe on a better team he would have played better um although the 2019 la galaxy weren't a horrible team they had a lot of talent on it um you know the same with antuna i thought antuna was okay in major league soccer i think he's playing better uh, with chivas recently so um those are things to sort of look at you can look at the loans is being when you have good players on loan, it ends up being a bad thing because you can't keep them if they're too expensive. But when you have bad players on long contracts, Jorgen Shelvick or even people Gonzalez, that's bad because you have no flexibility with, with getting rid of them or, or using that. So there's a fine line in the dance in between both of those things, which is a permanent player who's a bad contract or a loan player who's good and you can't keep. Uh, there's probably the loan player you can't keep is the better deal of those two. Um, and so therefore, I think if you err on the caution side of those loan deals, um, you know, the good players you can't keep puts you in a better situation than the bad players you're stuck with. Does, does that yeah, make sense? But then you do, yeah, you, yeah I, I, and I get that and you're right, but it then puts you back in the situation of every year you start the season off. Okay, what's our culture? What, what do we stand for? You know, uh, culture is more than players. I understand that, but it, it's associated with players. You associate um, Barcelona with Messi. You associate... Um, um, I think the galaxy probably always be associated with Beckham and Landon Donovan. And if guys are coming in, you know, if it's a turnstile and people are coming in and out every year, 
I, I just think it's it's hard to build that foundation. And the Galaxy, I mean, let's face it, the Galaxy haven't been in MLS Cup Finals since uh, 2014. That's the longest stretch in franchise history. They've been to the playoffs once in the last four seasons. They need they need to build something, and it, it's hard to build something if your top players are you know are are leaving after a year. But yeah. whether it's alone or, or whatever reason is, um, I, I just think that they need a little bit more stability. Yeah, they do. Coaches uh, too. Coaches too. We're going to talk about coaches in a minute. I mean, they've had four coaches in the last four seasons. Yeah, I, I mean the the perfect sort of answer is or, or the 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 perfect sort of definition of the LA Galaxy right now is you have Christian Pavone, who was your best player, who you may not be able to keep because he was on loan, or you had Chicharito, who you gave you know a three year contract and a ton of money to, um, and who scored three goals, you know, in in all twenty two of the LA Galaxy's games in in twenty twenty. Um, so you're stuck with one of those contracts, and I'll let you know it's not the Pavone contract. Contract, right, I mean, yeah, that, that, that makes your argument right there. It, you you have two guys, one on loan, one on a on a long term contract, and you wish you could flip those two because one was valuable and you can build around them. But it's not the guy on the contract. No, and and that's I, I think that's where the LA Galaxy are right now. That that's the perfect sort of dichotomy of the LA Galaxy and and, and where they've been. Um, you know, I think the last you know three or four years, certainly since 2017, um, they just they haven't gotten the big calls right. Um, and you need to hit on your designated players because they're there. They need to be your game changers, and they're the ones who are supposed to be on the field, you know, for as much as possible. I have a I have a geography question for you today. Oh, uh, by the way, before you get yes. away from that, who was on the field? You say you want them on the field as much as possible. So only one player that played every minute last year for the. I, I guess maybe two um, that played every minute last year, right? Pavone was one. There was only one who played every minute, and there was another one who played every game. Uh, right. Okay. Pavone played every played minute of every, every minute. game. Yes, that's yeah. what you want from your DP, and then the other player, of course, in Sua started every game, but came out of at least one game. Yeah, a couple, a couple different games. He was a couple minutes short, uh, not not too far. Um, my geography question is: um, Where in the world right now is Jonathan Dos Santos, according to his Instagram? Wow, um, Marrakesh. <laughs> no, but you, I think you're on the right side of the world at least. Um, it seems at least. Um, and unless Jonathan Dos Santos is getting deliveries of German papers in his house in Los Angeles, it seems that Jonathan Dos Santos, for whatever reason, is in Germany. Um, I, I don't know that there's any explanation for that. Uh, I, I, I honestly, I asked and everybody sort of said, I don't know. So that seems to be the case, uh, at least according to his Instagram. And again, it's social media stalking. And that could have been a picture from you know, years ago, who knows? Um, but at least the, the photo that he posted today, and it was certainly shown around the discord. And I think around Twitter as well as the Jonathan Dos Santos is in Germany. Um, and if that's the case, that'll be an interesting story. Cause I don't think now is the perfect time to be world traveling, but maybe he is. Um, did, I don't know. Could, could you see a crowd in that picture? I no, did not no, see picture. no, it was a picture. You gotta, you gotta look and see, is anyone in the background wearing a mask? And it also brings to mind the question of, I thought he was supposed to be sheltering at home like the rest of us. Apparently not. If he went to Germany, I'm sure that there was a quarantine that he had to go through. And I also warn from experience, uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to mess up this first name, I know, but it's, it's I think it's Kasiki Honda, who was the Japanese national team player, who was part of a Galaxy rumor about two or three years ago. And you and I talked about it on the show. And we talked about pictures that showed him at LAX. Right. And the pictures did show him at LAX. And he was at LAX. Only he was at LAX like three years earlier. Right. And everyone jumped all over that. He's coming to negotiate with the Galaxy. And the pictures were three years. He was in Japan at the time or somewhere else. Yeah. So I I, I, I don't know why he would be in Germany, but... Um, it, if he a, wants to bring me back one of those big soft pretzels, those are great. By the time you brought it back, it wouldn't be soft anymore. It would be stale. <laughs> no. so I, that's not one of those things that you want to travel with, I don't think. Um, let's uh, let's move on here and, and wrap things up on this show. Uh, certainly, uh, with a little talk about announcements and coaches and, and some players, um, you know, uh, and we told you as we're in this moat between the two holidays, um, as I guess I have correctly. Back to the moat again. Yes, yes. I, I'm going to write down moat right now. That needs to probably be part of the title. I've, I've mentioned it enough. It, can you put down a drawbridge that goes over the moat? And does the moat have alligators in it? Um, I would, in, in 2020, the moat has alligators. Absolutely. Okay. There, there are some alligators. There are some crocodiles, as a matter of fact, um, as well. Um, so uh, as we're in this sort of moat between the holidays, I'll, I'll just stick with it, keep saying it. Maybe we'll make it a thing. Um, we realized, and we told you this, you know, before the holiday sort of break started, that the LA Galaxy would be unlikely to to make any announcements between Christmas and New Year's, and it's just because it's a it's a media black hole right now. Um, you know, people are 
if they're at it's a work, media moat it's a media moat it's a medium i don't think i don't think we can keep going to the to the moat well okay um I, too many times the moat it's will a, run dry a, okay it's a moat point <laughs> people are turning it off right now they don't even care we're going to tell them when the, when we expect these announcements they're turning it off uh all right um no, it, but if you look at this, um, you know, we told you it, it was unlikely the Galaxy would be making any announcements in this break. It still seems highly unlikely. In fact, I'm told it, it's probably not going to happen. Um, you're really looking at the beginning of the year. And the beginning of the year isn't January 1st. It's not like the Galaxy are going to come out on January 1st and suddenly announce this stuff. It's probably the, the 4th, which is, which is a Monday, which is the first Monday. So look at the 4th and the 5th sort of as your guideline of when these things are expected to happen. But... We imagine, and we're, 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 I think I'm hinting pretty hard here, is that um, the coach announcement, the coach uh, deal should be done, um, and therefore the LA Galaxy can make an announcement on that. Uh, I think, Kevin, you and I are still on the It's Greg Vanny um, yep. a, a wheel uh, or, or boat in the moat. I don't know. I, I, we've gone too many different things, but Greg Vanny on that. And then we also expect some player announcements as well to sort of kick off this new year. As long as everything is done, everything is signed, the league has approved everything. And remember, the league is probably a little quiet between these two um, holidays as well. So all this stuff could be backing up and it may go a little bit longer, but it seems like beginning of the year, the fourth and the fifth is when you're going to get your coach's announcement followed probably the next day by the player announcements um, that we have. And you know, one of the things is player announcement we expect is going to be, you know, Jorge uh, Villafania. Um, so we expect Villafania to be announced uh, on that. And then there may be other player announcements that um, that we haven't talked about. And it's probably not anything big. It may be somebody who had a renewed contract or something like that. But that's sort of what we're expecting in terms of the LA Galaxy and when they're going to yeah, announce things. Yeah, we've been told we've been told to think about players um, being announced. And, and Villafania would certainly be one. Um, and, and again, like you said, we don't know. The other players could be somebody that uh, the option wasn't picked up, like an Insua who gets his option picked up, but, uh, or it could be Leo Messi, maybe. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's their, they just they, they would announce via Fania, and then in that same press release, it's like, oh, by the way, we signed yeah. Leo Messi as well. Um, the second the paragraph would be, via Fania will be joined by new arrival Leo Messi. <laughs> If he can uh, get over the moat, if he can, if he can clear that moat for sure. Um, all right, so uh, that's sort of where I think we all sit. I mean, yeah. I haven't heard of any other big players. Uh, my guess would be it would either be a minor deal or, or again, p- most likely somebody who's who was out of contract who had their option or whatever picked up. Um, I, I I haven't heard anything about any any name player that would. Would be bigger than Savia Fania. Yeah, I think uh, Miguel Abara was the other one that was sort of mentioned. Um, I don't know if that is is still. A that thing. would be a good pickup, actually. It would be an interesting one. There's some there's some things certainly to discuss about that. Um, but yeah, it would be an interesting pickup uh, whenever all that happens as well. But I mean, these are all the things that you're sort of looking at. We we've told you about where the LA Galaxy stand um, in terms of the roster, and we technically have 17 players signed to the LA Galaxy for 2021. We know that there are three young kids the LA Galaxy have signed as well. Um, and that brings it up to 20. Um, so really, you're looking at the LA Galaxy filling 10 spots. Pavone isn't included in those 10, so he would take up one of those. And if you try to make a starting lineup, which we did as a joke um, before we did our last live show of 2020 um, with Eric, I, I said make a starting lineup between all the guys who are currently on the field, and you would struggle to make a starting lineup. So the 10 additional players the LA Galaxy are going to bring in for 2020, I would have to imagine, you know, five of those or maybe even six of those are starting players. And there's a whole bunch of question marks surrounding, you know, guys like Perry Kitchen um, and other option decline guys of, you know, David Bingham, whether David Bingham is back, whether the LA Galaxy need to get a starting goalkeeper. Um, there's a whole bunch of interesting, you know, sort of side notes and, and dips and turns that the LA Galaxy you're going to have to fill in to even get a starting lineup with these last remaining 10. And then you throw into that, Kevin, the fact that, they had, don't have an announced head coach, even though we believe that uh, if if uh, that the head coach is probably already making decisions for this team, and the Galaxy and MLS are just waiting on the announcement. Well, here's a really interesting thing: with uh, if 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 we're right with Greg Vanny, and that's that Dominic Kinnear then once again, you know, gets the Miss Congeniality Award. Does Dominic come back? And and that to me, that's kind of a, a conundrum because. He's done everything they've asked. He's twice put his neck on the line and become the interim coach. I don't know what they gave him financially. To, to did, did, they, did they make him whole or did they just say, you're under contract 
as the assistant and there is no head coach, therefore you're the head coach. I mean, I, I don't know how that worked, but my point being twice they made him the interim coach, twice he proved himself, twice they told him, or once now they, they told him, we don't have a spot for you. They're about to do that again. Does he come back as an assistant coach? I, I, I don't know what his relationship is with Greg Vanny, but Greg Vanny has a reputation, I, I believe, of being very good with his assistant coaches. Robin Frazier went on from Toronto to become the head coach at, at Colorado. Um, you know, he's he, he has a good reputation of, of having good staffs. Does Dominic, once again, swallow and come back? And is, is that... Is that not? I don't want to say a disgrace, but is that sort of a uh, a humiliation that once again you didn't get the job? You're good enough to be the number one assistant, but you're not good enough to get the job. In fact, um, we're not even really sure how much of a, a, a you know a, of a sincere interview they're giving you. Does does Dominic come back, or does he maybe sit out the season and and try to hook on somewhere else? I mean, it depends on I think what he wants out of all of this. If he wants a head coaching job. Um, then that would mean that I think he has to move on. If he's sort of content with being an assistant coach, uh, perhaps Vanny has a place for him. I also think that Vanny's going to bring a whole crew of people with him uh, whenever he left Toronto. Um, I believe you know most of the coaching staff and, and probably some of the support staff will leave and, and sort of join him in L.A. I mean, it, it seems likely that, that if Greg Vanny is coming, and we do expect that, that he's going to have control over this team um, and how to put it together that perhaps other people haven't, um, whether that's control of scouting or, or different things that sort of give him the, the leg up. There had to be some deal sweeteners to sort of make him the guy. And with him being such an obvious choice for the L.A. Galaxy, um, you would expect that he had to find some leverage somewhere and flex some of that that muscle from him, especially for a guy who was making, you know, some of the technical decisions and, and being a GM at one point as well. And so now he's coming to a place that already has a GM. Um, and so, you know, Vanny probably gets to take a bigger bite of, of Dennis DeClose's, you know, operational, um, you know, uh, uh, budget and 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 just the the operation of the of the senior team that maybe somebody else would and I would have to imagine that Dominic Kinnear doesn't have that same leverage right and so if if Greg Vanny is that I don't in me I think it's untenable that that Kinnear would stay again and quite honestly I was almost a little surprised that Kinnear would would want to try and be that interim coach again. Uh, for a little bit of time and didn't tell the Galaxy basically to shove it um, whenever he had the chance. But that's well, I, maybe that's more me than than him. And with the limited number of head coaching jobs in Major League Soccer, maybe you jump at any chance you get. Yeah, I, I don't think Kinnear is a shove it guy, but I do think if he had said that, I do I do think almost everybody would have said, yeah, I can see why he would feel that way. You're right. I hadn't thought about that. And when Ziggy came in and Dominic became his number one assistant, it was a sort of a marriage of convenience. It was perfect marriage too. Remember Ziggy had been fired by Seattle. His, his staff was still in Seattle. In fact, his number one assistant, Brian Smetzer was, was the manager of the Sounders. So Ziggy didn't have a staff like Guillermo did and like Fanny has. And so, um, Kinnear was available because he'd been fired by San Jose and Ziggy needed to get up to speed really quickly and brought in a, a, a sec, a second head coach, kind of like, like uh, you know, Bruce had with Dave. So yeah, I, I I I see that. I see what you're talking about now. So so why did Dom stay when Guillermo came? Well, because he needed someone to translate for the players, partly, and he needed someone that knew MLS. Remember, Guillermo was bringing up his whole staff from Argentina, but nobody had any idea about MLS. That that made Dominic very valuable. And you're right. If Vanny is bringing the majority of his coaching staff. It could be difficult. Um, to who you know when it's time for the, for uh, a vote, does Dominic's vote count more because he's been a two-time world uh, you know MLS Cup winning coach? Um, does he all of a sudden get more uh, of a listen than the guy that Vanny's been working with the last couple of seasons in Toronto? You're right. It could be very uncomfortable, and it, it, it for both uh, for both Dom and for the new coaching staff. So I hadn't thought about all those options. Yeah, it might be a. a you know, Dama said he's very happy being the second banana and he doesn't need to be in the limelight, but it this might be a little bit uncomfortable. It, it may be. And who knows? He may stay and, you know, all of that was, was totally a, a, a moot point, but um, it's it, it's just another sort of twist and turn. And I think that when Vanny gets announced, and again, that sort of seems to be the way, I mean... Would I be surprised if there was a last minute collapse and that Dominic Kinnear ended up at this point? I kind of would be. Um, it, well, it's happened before. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know it has. Um, I would be surprised, though. That's that's how far along all this seems. Is well, what that, happened that, to the guy that 
it happened last what time with did he did he land anywhere did he land on his feet i believe you call him caleb is that is that <laughs> is that is that is, that is where, Cal- yeah, caleb. caleb porter yeah uh he did he did okay this year uh he did okay but, you know it, it can't collapse this time because there's no laker game to sit courtside at well there is a game but you can't sit courtside there so do, do they take him to an empty stadium uh, an empty arena when there's nobody <laughs> maybe, there and, maybe and, they do i don't know i don't we'll, we'll have to wait for for greg vanny from center court um you know after training or something like that so that way uh he can, he can you know the first time i'm Roman Alessandrini was at a Laker game after they had signed him. I think they announced it. I don't know if they did a press availability. They must not have because I hadn't met him and I was covering a Laker game. And there he was at sitting in the galaxy seats at center court. That's how they kind of introduced Roman Alessandrini to Los Angeles. Um, Put him up on the, on the, on the video board and the yep. whole thing. Yep. Hey, I mean, you know, you, if, if you're the, if you're the LA galaxy, you got that AEG connection, you, you flex those, those muscles whenever you need to. And Ramon was a big uh, NBA, NBA guy um, as well. So um, all, all interesting. Hey, um, real quick before we get out of here, uh, we have another article. Uh, Romero has been doing a great job writing some really interesting articles, and he takes a look at the right-back position. So a little analysis on the right-back position and who could possibly fill as both a right-back backup and somebody who could possibly be a starter. And there's a very uh, fun uh, LA Galaxy, uh, former LA Galaxy player who is listed on there. Um, so, you know, I, I, I can say AJ De La Garza because most of you already put that together. Um, just go read what he has to say because there's some interesting sort of uh, uh, comparisons and different things that you can look at with, with AJ and some uh, other players as well. So that's up on our site right now. Sean right Franklin. Now. Sean like Franklin. Sean. I think Sean, I've talked to Sean. I think he's probably done. I don't, I don't think he's coming back. Um, right. So so what, what's going on with uh, with um, well, Shelvix is gone. How about Ralph Felcher? Is he in that? Uh, is he, he in that story? He's gone. You know, he's he is in the story at the very beginning where they say he signed for the Bundesliga two team, uh, and he's done. So no more Ralph Felcher. Um, That's why Jonah is in Germany. He's going. <laughs> he's hanging out with his bud. <laughs> They're singing songs all the way. Is that what? Is that what it was? You you solved the mystery, Kevin. There it was. I'm, there I'm, it, I'm, it, it all comes together. Yep. He he convinced Jonathan Dos Santos to go to to uh, to Bundesliga with him. So all right. Uh, did, anything did, else? Yeah, one last story on Rolf. It's really interesting. I was doing a story on him earlier this year, and he was talking about this this, this surprise he would put together for his wife, and he had to lure her to a recording studio. It's a long story, but he had to lure her to a recording studio. And she said, is something going on with your career? And he said, yeah, yeah, it's going to be a big announcement. And, she, and he said, she thought I was going to a good club or something. And then <laughs> once he realized that he had just thrown the galaxy under the bus, he tried to backtrack. But uh, so that's what Rolf apparently thought of the galaxy, that uh, someday he would go back to a good club. Or at least his wife thought that. That's actually yeah. what that says. His wife thought that the LA Galaxy were not a good club. And wives get you into trouble. Just ask a tie. <laughs> that, that, that certainly can happen. Talk All about right. a moot, moot point. Uh, a a moot, moot point. point. That's a moot yes. point, yes. Uh, very good. All right. Uh, if, if you don't have anything else, then certainly you can't I possibly. I always do. I keep no, going. No, no, no. We're, we're done. So uh, we're done. If, you look, if you're looking for Mr. Kevin Baxter on Twitter, you can find him at kbaxter11. Head on over to the LA Times for all of Kevin's uh, wonderful soccer coverage. He has a great article in there. A little update about uh, Dr. Good. If you listen to Kevin during the podcast, you'll want to go to the LA Times, look up that article. Uh, it was an update. It's a sad update, um, but I think it was it was wonderfully put by Mr. Kevin Baxter. So uh, go check that out as well. All right. If you're looking for me on Twitter, at Jay Guessman, at Galaxy Podcast, cornerofthegalaxy.com. All of our articles, I'm going to have a Pavone rumor update for you, uh, hopefully sometime on Tuesday morning as we work towards 2021. Remember, no live show on Thursday because it's New Year's Eve. I'm not recording on New Year's Eve. Our first live show of 2021 will be on January 7th, so you can tune in for that. All right. Uh, for Mr. Kevin the Panda Baxter, I'm Josh Pato Guessman. You've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Arajo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.